So the story I'm about to tell you really is the theme of the sermon. Little girl is in sick kids hospital, not here in Toronto, but in a, in a children's hospital. She has a blood disease. Her brother, who's four years old, had the same disease in his blood, but his immune system fought the disease and he became better. But her immune system isn't fighting the disease. So the doctor sits down with the parents and says, look, we have a problem, but here's the solution. If your son who's four years old gives your daughter eight years old a blood transfusion, she will get better. But here's the thing, we need the four-year-old to agree to the blood transfusion. So the parents and the doctor sit down with the little four-year-old boy trying to get him to understand this, and they said to him, you have to understand that your sister has the same sickness as you, but your blood worked to get you better, but her blood isn't working to get her better. And if she doesn't get better, she's going to go see Jesus, and she will die. The little boy said, the parents said, but there's a solution. If you give her your blood, she will live. And the little boy with a smile on his face said, yes, she can have my blood. So they took the little boy and the little girl into the room and they laid them down on a bed together. And they took the wires and the tubes and all the medical stuff, which I don't know how to describe, and they put them in the two children and they started the transfusion. The little boy laid there quietly because he was told not to move. And he watched his blood go out of him and go over into his sisters and he smiled. And five minutes into it, all of a sudden, he became terrified. And his mummy looks at him and says, what's wrong, sweetheart? And he looks at his mummy and says, so when do I die? See, the little boy wasn't told that it's just a blood, they're going to take just a little bit of your blood. He thought he was giving all his blood so that his little sister could live. Here is one of the greatest things that's paralyzing a Christian in Canada today. It's courage. People are so opposite, discouraged, people are just opposite to courage. If you notice courage on your screen, you will see that courage affects nearly all parts of your life. Achievement, inheritance, activities, fitness, it, 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 taking a risk, being a leader. You can never be a leader without courage. Being led by the Holy Spirit, being able to take an adventure or a challenge and, and if you don't think taking up your cross daily is a challenge, then you haven't taken up your cross. And what has happened is we have become so comfortable with doing church and being religious and looking like we're Christians, we have missed out on probably one of the greatest things God wants us to have. Are you ready? Courage. In Acts 27, Paul is in a, a storm on the sh a ship. He's being taken to Rome to explain to the emperor about his Christianity. And all of a sudden, it's been a few days now, the ship is just tossed around. They think it's going to sink. And Paul says in Acts 27, 21, and they had gone a long time without food. Paul stood up before them and said, men, sailors, you should take some food. Listen to my advice not to sail to Crete, but you would have spared yourself from this damage and loss. But now I urge you, keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men. For I have faith, did you hear this? For I have faith in God, that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. This is how I look at godly courage. Godly courage is doing God's will because you are trusting him, 
getting rid of the fear by living in faith. Paul, uh, John Piper, one of the greatest pastors going, he writes, Christian courage is the willingness to say and do the right thing regardless of the earthly cost because God promised to help you and save you on the account of Christ. An act takes courage if it will likely be painful. The pain may be physical as in war or rescue operation, or the pain may be mental as in confrontation and controversy. Here, here's the thing I've learned, and I've learned this so well. Your Christian walk takes courage to be able to stand your ground, to be able to stand up at work in a, a diplomatic way, and to be able to make sure they know that I live by Christian principles. To be able to work with family members or even friends where you have the courage to have the standard that is biblical versus the standard that is not. And somebody says to me, give me some truth from the Word of God that will help me with courage. So you, number one, this is what I've learned, is faith in God instead of faith in yourself. To have courage, you put faith in God. This is what Paul wrote in Acts 27. So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. I have faith in God. God, I don't have faith in myself. My, myself will, uh, if I have faith in myself, I have no courage. But I have faith in God. This is what the Hebrews write, it says, let us run endurance race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our, what? Faith. Now, what happens is the, the writer of Hebrews is reflecting back to Peter walking on the water. Remember, this is one of these stories which if I was one of the disciples, I probably would kick myself for the rest of my life. Here's 12 of them, and Jesus said, come. And Peter gets out, and he keeps his eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And it, see, you can have your own courage, and it will be temporary. But you can have the courage like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, and all the great people in the Bible, who, who, even the guys in Hebrews who saw it in two, they kept their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And, and here's the craziest thing, you'll be able to walk on the water. How many times have I not had courage because my eyes were on something else other than on Christ. And this leads me to number two. Do not let circumstances or people control your faith. Let God control your faith. Do not let circumstances or people. Let, let me give you an illustration. A number of years ago, uh, I, I was here at the church, and I, I received a phone call from Promise Keepers Canada, which is a men's organization, huge. And they said, we would like you to speak at the Hershey Center in Mississauga. There'll be 4,300 men. As soon as they said that, I, I thought, I don't think so. And, and all of a sudden, then they said, and, and guess what? We want you to be the first speaker. You're going to kick it off. Who else will be speaking? And then they start telling me these NFL football players from the States and these big pastors from the States and a movie actor. They're all going to speak after me on Friday, Saturday. And it's like, and I, you're the only Canadian. And you're first. And I said to them, well, I need a couple days to think about it. I got off the phone. I said, there's no way. I mean, the fact is this, you don't preach when Elvis is coming behind you, or the Beatles. I don't know anything for young people, sorry. And all of a sudden, I started to go to number three. I started to read scripture. 
This is what I read. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. But then I twisted it. Billy, when you get up in front of those 4,300 men, forget the NFL, forget the movie star, forget the big preachers. Be strong in the Lord. You're not going to stand up there in yourself. You stand up there in yourself, you're going to just fail. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, and all of a sudden courage started. Listen to this, okay? Uh, in Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. And I was terrified of the 4,300. I was terrified of who's preaching with me. The Lord gave this commandment to Joshua, son of be strong and courageous, for you will bring the Israelite in the land, I promised you. Joshua 1, 7, be strong and courageous, be careful to obey all the laws of the commandment servant. Here's one, Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. First Chronicles 28, 20, David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God, my God, is with you. And all of a sudden, I just started reading Scripture, and I phoned them back that day and said, sure, let's do it. Now, just so you know, for some of you who are hyperactive in God, it didn't happen. I got to the Hershey Center, and what happened is, I know some of you think, and God gave you such boldness and confidence, you were jumping out of your skin, you could have taken on Goliath. No. What happened is, a half an hour before I was supposed to speak, I looked out and saw 4,300 men, and their faces were like vinegar. And all of a sudden, the fear, the, the apprehend, the discouragement, not encouragement, but discouragement. And it was like, oh God, just call the rapture. Get me out of here. It's time for, a, okay, let's do something. Like, and I, you know how many times I went to the bathroom before I got on the stage? I just, and I did not know I had that much stuff in me. Okay, I remember them announcing, ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Billy Richards, I turned to the guy, I said, do I have time to go to the bathroom? No, they just called your name, get out there. And he gave me a little push. And I got out there and I looked at 4,300 men and you would think all of a sudden Jehovah Jireh would come down and I would be bold in God. And I looked at them and I go, good, good, good evening. And all of a sudden, I just put my eyes on Christ because I knew I was dead meat if I wasn't, and the Lord started to use me. Faith in God, these people, the circumstances aren't going to control me, and I'm going to stand on the Scripture because faith comes by hearing, are you ready, God's Word. So somebody says to me, give me the homework. Give me the application to take home so I can do something. Are you ready? Number one. If this is not true, I apologize to you. But I think in my heart, my own opinion, every one of us in this room has one area of our lives where we do not have the courage of God. Number one, we need to confess and admit it to the Lord. One of the greatest things I did was when they told me promise keepers and this 4,300 Hershey Center is read scripture and then just sit down at my chair in my office and, and say, Lord, I can't do this without you. To be able to share your heart with the Lord because he is Father God. Where the Lord speaks to you through his scripture and the Lord shows you, yes, you can't do it, but with me you can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you if he calls you to it. And, and be able to admit it 
See, a lot of us, we're faking it. Oh no, I have courage. Yeah, well, okay, show us. Don't tell us. Oh, I can do that. No, show us. Well, no, I, I don't have time. Or you make some excuse to get out of it, but here's the truth. You're wetting your pants because if you ever did it, you would drop. When we confess and we admit it to the Lord and we humble ourselves, the Bible teaches us he will raise us up. But here's the craziest thing. A lot of us don't want to confess or admit it because then if we admit it or confess it, we have to do something about it. But if we keep hiding it, we think God won't get us. which is nonsense. Number two, wait upon God. And, and the word waiting, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew your strength, you shall mount up with the wings of eagles, and you shall walk, not be weary. This is scripture, right? Okay, the word waiting does not mean I'm just praying. The word waiting means I am praying and doing so that God can move. Watch this. God is sitting at the table in the restaurant, and I am the waiter. What is my job? To be able to hear what he wants and then do so that we can work in harmony. They that wait upon the Lord, he will give me strength he will help me. And the key here is, okay, Lord, what do you want? And all of a sudden, what you're doing is you want to hear what God wants from Scripture or support groups or from people or prayer or whatever, or in your heart you know what God wants. Let me give you an illustration about this. Before I ever met my wife, before I even, even knew her, Three of my friends, one of them was getting divorced and two of them filed for separation. They were married already. One of my friends in his 30, he was getting separate, uh, divorced and his wife, two of my friends who, who had got married before me were, were separating. Okay, can I just share this? When you have three friends and their marriages have gone south, this is not really encouraging to want to try to find a wife. But what happened is, remember, uh, my motto for that was, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. So I just started waiting upon the Lord. Lord, what do you want? Am I going to get a wife and it's going to go sour in a few years? If that's so, why would you do that? Why are we doing this? Let's not do this. And all of a sudden, as I waited upon the Lord, the Lord started to show me, get your eyes off of those and get your eyes on Christ. Here's the key to waiting, taking small steps with the Holy Spirit in order to become victorious. Number three, this is probably one of the most important ones I give to you, having support not only from God, but support from people. This is where I need to talk to you. For some of you, and I love you very much, you show up Sunday morning, or some of you don't even show up Sunday morning, and, and you're trying to become victorious in Christ, but you're treating the body of Christ as something I try to fit into my life. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the church, is not something I fit into my life. It is my life. The body of Christ, the church, you are going to be with for eternity. Your career, you're not. That car you love, no. That house, no. Even some of the people around you, no. And what we've done is we've treated the body of Christ as if I have time. Yet the body of Christ is set up to be a support system. 
Example, small groups. We have tons of small groups, 12 steps, uh, uh, anger management, all these different small groups. Friday night men's program, Friday night women's program, 26 North for people who are 26 to 35. All these programs, they're not here to occupy our time. They're there to help support us and us support others because freely you've received, freely you should give. And through that, we help each other and we encourage. You know the root of encouragement is courage. We help encourage those who are discouraged so they will have courage. Support. But not only is the church there to support us, but having a Christian marriage that can support us. My, my, my wife, she is there to help increase my courage, not in myself, but in Christ, and I'm there to help increase her courage, and therefore what we do is we do not condemn each other because Christ did not come to condemn, but he came to save, but we encourage. But also having a good, godly friend, like uh, I have a friend named Chuck. I mean, Chuck doesn't get on the phone and take my head off, but Chuck gets on the phone and encourages me. This week, here's the one he gave me. I've talked to him around five times this week. I think the longest conversation was six minutes, and here's one of the verses he kept shooting at me all week. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Grow up. And then he would hang up. But you know what? He was there to encourage so I could have courage. The last one I give to you is this, take your time. There is always that testimony where I was so discouraged or I was fearful or I was scared or I was terrified of failure, da, 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 da. And then the Holy Spirit touched me and all of a sudden I could take on a lion. That's a wonderful testimony. But for 99 of us, it's baby steps in the Holy Spirit. I never started preaching or speaking with 4,300. The first time I ever spoke in public was on, uh, we were witnessing on the street, and I, some guy challenged me to start preaching. And I, 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 and I forget what the challenge was, and I did it. And I got seven people who weren't Christians to stand around, and I held them for five minutes. And all of a sudden, I thought, wow. I mean, you don't go from zero to 100 just like that. It takes time. Courage is going to help you succeed in God. But the key to this is faith, where God helps give you courage. Look at the whole Bible. David and Goliath. It's because he had an incredible devotional life with God. He had courage to take on the big giant for one reason. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, fiery furnace. Daniel, lion's den. Jesus went to Gethsemane three times in order so he could have courage in order to do the cross. I love this. Here's my story. Put the guy's face up. It's just incredible. He is such a good looking guy. This is DeMar Hamlin, NFL Buffalo Bills. I don't like the Buffalo Bills, but I do like him. Last January, last January, eight months ago, he was playing football, playoff game. And he had a cardiac arrest, a heart attack during the game. I don't know if you were watching the game, but he was down. They, had, they went to so many commercials because they had to try to get him back to life. 
His heart literally stopped, and they just started working on him on the field, and they took him off. Ambulance came onto the field. They whipped him in the ambulance, took him off to the hospital. They thought he was going to die. During this horrific time, he wrote on Twitter, cover me in all these moments, God. Every breath I take is filled with your strength and your guidance. It's not easy, but I know it will be all worth it one day at a time I know you got my back last Sunday the Buffalo Bills were playing and DeMar came on the field and he tackled three good tackles which is huge and he played like there was nothing wrong. Now, let me ask you something. DeMar has enough money to live on for the rest of his life. He also is so good, he'll be a broadcaster when he finishes the NFL. He's got everything. Would you, after having a massive heart attack that took you this close to death, eight months later, be on the field with those big NFL football players who could literally crush you. And somebody says, that takes a lot of courage. Are you ready? He says, my faith is in God. My faith is in God. Some of you, you need to witness you don't have courage. Some of you, you're terrified to speak in tongues and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need courage. Some of you, 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 you just to, you, 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 well, you know, I'll get this close to God, but I don't want to get any closer. You need courage. Some of you, you know God wants to use you more in business and success in business, and yet you don't have courage. Some of you, you know that your marriage needs to get closer to God and closer to each other, and you know you gotta give up stuff. You need courage. Courage will stimulate leadership, courage, adventure, it will encourage. And how do we do it? Here's the sermon. Faith in God. 